Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be back with you guys. Just a couple quick things to go over before we start the service this morning. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you again for your patience uh, as we work through this time um, of change. And even though it is a different, it's different for us, we know that God is in this and providing for us in it as well. Uh, so there's a change of service as our normal service schedule's changed a bit. There's no singing for this time. There will be additional scripture reading as we look at God's law, I'll look at God's work in the Psalms, and also then look at the good news of the gospel as we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God preached. So that's what we'll be doing this morning. One a couple other quick announcements is uh, offering boxes are at the back of the auditorium, just one there and then one over by the secretary's office. If you'd like to put your offering or tithe in there, that'd be great. Uh, also, if you want to check your mailboxes uh, over by the bathrooms, that would be good as there are some things for you to probably pick up in your mailboxes. As we prepare to, to read, I want to read also, uh, we'll be looking at Commandment 3 and 4 in Exodus this morning. And there's a quote I had found from J.C. Ryle. Lived in a quite different time, 1800s. So take this with that thought that he lives at a different time. And he's talking about commandment four, and he says this, never be absent from God's house on Sundays without good reason. Never to miss the Lord's Supper when administered in our own congregation. Never to let our place be empty when means of grace are going on. This is one way to be a growing and prosperous Christian. The very sermon that we needlessly miss may contain a precious word and season for our souls. The very assembly for prayer and praise from, where, from which we stay away may be the very gathering that, we that would have cheered and established and quickened our hearts. If you please turn with me to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, we'll, I'll be reading verses 7 through 11. Would you please stand with me as I read in honor of God's word? Exodus 20, starting in verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son, or your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. I also want to point out too that in God's goodness of giving the, the law, uh, we see that it's reminding us of our need of Christ, our, our daily need to submit to his lordship and to trust his care in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Lord's Day for us to gather, for the freedom in which we have to gather. The belief, Lord, that you have called us to gather, that we would do that with joy and with uh, looking forward to it in our hearts so that as we hear your word preached, as we hear it read, that we would be encouraged, that we would be renewed in our thinking, renewed in our hearts. But Lord, we also know even from this text that we do not maintain that right respect and honor of your name as we ought to. We do not Remember your character as your word lays it out for us. But also, Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a greater reverence, not just for your name, but also for your day, for the seventh day of rest. For this time to, to gather, set aside the things of the world, and to remember the model that you had in creation of taking that day of rest. It is b good uh, for both body and soul. So help us in this 
We pray in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We go over now to our reading in Psalms, Psalm 136. We've been working through the Psalm little by little over the past couple weeks. If you remember, we've seen in verses one through three, the character of God. And it's been consistent that his character is, is flowing forth in this steadfast love that endures forever, this constant reminder before us in this psalm. Verses four through nine, we see his care and love in creation. And in this passage, verses 10 through 16, we're gonna see his powerful deliverance from the hand of the enemy. Uh, but reminding us ourselves as well that uh, God in Christ provides redemption for both body and soul. So verses 10 through 16, follow along with me. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt for his steadfast love endures forever and brought Israel out from among them for his steadfast love endures forever with a strong hand and an outstretched arm for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two for his steadfast love endures forever and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. I would encourage you too this week to take a look at Psalm 78. Um, it's, a, it's a great passage a little longer of a psalm, but there's a number of times in there that it shows God's provision. And the verses leading up to verse 17 deal with this same section of scripture, dealing with how God provided for his people and being uh, redeemed from Pharaoh and the slavery. And verse 17 reminds us of our struggle. And it says this, yet they still sinned more against him after four or five verses of reminding the people of God's redemption and bringing them out from Pharaoh, you see they still sinned against him and they continued rebelling against the Most High. So let us then go to our last uh, passage, Galatians 3. <clears throat> Galatians 3, we're starting in verse 10. We've seen the law. We've seen God's work. We've seen his character. And for this uh, short passage, if you please again stand with me. Galatians 3, verses 10 through 13. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we come before you. And after reading your law, after understanding your character, we also see, Lord, that that is not consistent with us. Naturally, we go against that. Naturally, we, we do not value you. We do not respect you as we ought to. So, Lord, continue through your spirit and your word. Continue your work in your people. And Lord, we stand together today and we praise you for the redemption found in Christ. That he took the curse of sin for his people, gladly, joyfully, so that we might become the sons of, of God. That we might be seen as right. Instead of being cursed, we're seen as right. 
because of the faith that you've given us to express itself in believing in Christ and his finished work at the cross. So we praise you, Lord, that we are not cursed, but we are blessed. And may this change the way in which we live, that we might live joyfully and rightly, Lord, before the face of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. We are coming back to the book of Malachi. This is the book we were preaching through before um, we took a break and we focused on John 17 for several weeks. Now we are coming back to look at the last two chapters of the book of Malachi. So it's been a, f- a few months, but we're back. Let me, let me start by reminding us or, or t- telling us about a story from church history, okay? There once was a man named John Calvin, and he was a young, fiery pastor, and he had strong biblical convictions uh, but those, and, and he eventually made his way to, to the city of Geneva. But his strong biblical convictions were met with much opposition. People did not like his zeal, his intensity. He was, and, and, and couple that with the fact that he was with Pharrell, who was even more intense, more zealous, more fiery. And eventually things did not go well for Calvin. And it, it revolved around his, his idea of communion, that communion was not to be an open communion. It was not for everybody. It's reserved for those saints who are walking by faith in Christ through repentance. And so the, the church and the city did not like this position Calvin had on communion. So they <clears throat> kicked him out of the city of Geneva. They said, you have 24 hours to leave. And we don't, we don't want you to be our pastor. We don't even want you to be a resident in our city. Leave now. And he was, he was gone from the city for three years. But eventually the city realized, wow, he was a good pastor and we really had something. <laughs> we didn't realize what we had. You know, we're willing to put up with this fire for his zeal. Come on back, please, Calvin, come on back. And, and Calvin now is a married man and he comes back with his, with his wife. And the very first Sunday that he goes to preach, he preaches the very next verse that he left off on preaching three years earlier. It, with, with no introduction, just I'm picking up just like he had just preached it last Sunday. So if Calvin could, after a three-year break, preach the very next verse, we can preach the very next verse of Malachi after a two-month break, okay? So, so bear with me. It's, it's not hard. We're going to do um, some, some introduction here as we remind ourselves where we're at in this book of Malachi. And the portion we're going to be looking at today is Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I know you've already um, been standing for the reading of God's Word, but I would ask you one more time to stand with me for the public reading of the Word of the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, 1 through 4 says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? He will be like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. You may be seated. So again, we will do some introduction for us to, to get us to where we're at. And when, we, when you think about this book of Malachi, it's, it's a beautiful book, very, very beautiful indeed. But there's, there's this contrast, these battling forms of wisdom in the book of, of Malachi. There's wisdom from below, which is expressed by the mouths of the people, and there's wisdom from above, heavenly wisdom, which comes from the mouth of God. And these two wisdoms are fighting against each other. God will declare something. The, the people will respond with, with 
a question or with sarcasm. And there's this battle of wisdom between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. Uh, There's this battle in the book of Malachi between what we think and what is actually true. And these are different. What we think and what is actually true are often, are most of the time, not the same thing. In the book of Malachi, we are reminded that our minds naturally are darkened by sin. In the book of Malachi, we are reminded that we do not think as we ought. You see, we all have, we all have dreams, right? We all have, have expectations, desires. We all have plans for how life should go and how things should be. This is my plan, and it's going to go smoothly from A to Z. Everything's going to work, and, and, and this, is, this is what I want for life. We think marriage, our marriage is going to be perfect. We think friendships will never disintegrate. I'll be best friends with this person till the day I die. We think others should treat me well and will always treat me well because it's me. Who could not treat me well? But the sad truth of life under the sun is that we find that all our expectations are not met. We find all of our expectations and desires and plans, many of them don't go realized at all, and the ones that do come with much hardship and pain. We find that life under the sun, life in this sin-cursed world, is hard. Everything is harder than we think it should be. Harder than what we plan for. This is something that every person comes to realize, something that every generation of man comes to realize, and every age of man comes to realize. Our ideals are not realized. Our dreams, our desires are not fulfilled. And the natural desire when this happens is for us to blame someone or something. Well, there has to be a reason why my life is so hard. There has to be a reason that this relationship is not as perfect as I want it to be. There has to be a reason why this thing isn't working as I planned. There has to be a reason why my children are so disobedient. And and we start pointing the, the finger at people or at circumstances and we start thinking that okay this thing this person is the reason why my expectations and desires are not being met and we start pointing the finger at all these things around us someone or something has to be in the wrong for this to be happening to me and sadly amongst the people of God and amongst the in the church we find that God is often the one who is blamed We think that because we are Christians, nothing bad should ever happen to us. And when something bad or difficult does happen to us, we say things like, God, how could you do this to me? God, why would you want this for me? I'm trying to do things right, and this is the thanks I get? Or we say things like, a good God wouldn't want me to suffer so much. I thought you were good. See, we all want peace. We all want rest. We all want liberty. These things are common to man. But when you realize life under the sun is not like that, sadly, many times we begin to blame God for our troubles. You see, man today is no different than man was 2,500 years ago when the prophet Malachi uttered these words. Man is not evolved into super spiritual we still struggle with the same sin same lust same desire same grumbling complaining spirit same lack of patience man is not changed and when we come to the book of malachi we have in this book a people who are disillusioned whose expectations have not been met you see Historically, where Malachi takes place is the people, because of their sin in the land of Israel, they were kicked out by God. God used a foreign army, a, a, an oppressor, to kick the people out of the land, to, to violently, physically remove them from the land into a land of exile, a foreign land, a strange land that they had not known before. And, but God promised, I will bring my people back. And after 70 years, as the prophet Jeremiah said, you will come back to the land. And these people were very excited at this promise of God, this promise of restoration, this promise of return from exile. And they had these grand dreams of when we get back, this is what it's going to be.
be like, oh, I can't wait. The fields will be ripe again. They'll be dancing. It will be merry just as it was before. The city will be booming, bustling. It'll be, it'll be the ideal place. Utopia on earth. I can't wait till we get back to Israel. But here's what happens. The people get back to Israel and what do they find? Wow, this is not at all what we expected. This is much harder than we thought. This is not going well. God, you promised us good things and, and life is hard. Enemies are all around us. I'm constantly being attacked. I'm constantly being persecuted. I'm constantly being, being, you know, struggling with life, making ends meet. Life is tough. God, what is going on? I thought you loved us. They had great thoughts of restoration, great thoughts of grand ideas of returning, great plans, but these things didn't turn out, not even close. They found hardships were everywhere they looked. Disappointment abounded. Expectations dashed. The Israelites did not find the return to the land of Israel easy like they had planned. Real rebuilding was harder and took way longer than they anticipated. Prosperity did not come back as it was before the exile. The way of life was very different than what the older generation remembered. Matter of fact, their life in Israel was not even as good as their life back in Babylon. That's why the majority of the Israelites chose to stay in Babylon, because life was not that bad. Babylon was a, was a bustling, thriving empire, the leading empire in the whole world. The economy was great. And now these people who have returned to Israel realize, man, we didn't have it so bad. This is way worse than we thought it was going to be. We had big plans. This is nothing like I thought. And their response to God at the beginning of the book of Malachi is, God, I thought you loved us. Who's to blame for these problems, for this calamity? God, I thought you loved us. Isn't this the common response of man? We are so nearsighted. We cannot see anything but what is right in front of our faces and when there's trouble and hardship, we look at the trouble and hardship and we throw up our hands just like the people 2,500 years ago and say, God, I thought you loved us. What's wrong? The, the problem is on your side of the equation, not ours. I thought you loved us. This life is not what I expected. These hardships feel like more than I can bear. We only see what is right before us. And when bad and hard things fall before our eyes, we fall into the trap of thinking, God must not love me. He must not really care about me. You know, I'm starting to doubt the veracity of any of his promises. But God responds to these grumbling, complaining people whose expectations have been dashed. He responds this way, I do love you. Remember your salvation. Remember how I chose you. Remember how I chose to save you of all the peoples on the earth. I chose to save you, to give you an eternal inheritance. I chose you of all the people on the earth to be my people. Is this not sure evidence of God's love? Oh, how we forget so easily what truly matters in the midst of hardship. Our lips are quick to grumble and complain to cast accusations against God and, and, and besmirch His character. When God calls His people, think again of my salvation. It's yours. It's not everybody's on earth. It's yours, my people, the ones I'm chose, who I've chose to be my possession forever. We need to remember this because everything in us will fight against that thought. See, we have to remember this right here. We do not judge God's love for us because of our circumstances in life. We do not look at our circumstances in life and say, okay, things are going well, God loves me. Things are not going well, He loves me not. This is wisdom from below. This is wisdom from the earth. This is not heavenly wisdom. This is wisdom that the enemy uses to destroy because when life gets hard, the enemy will whisper in the ear, see, I told you he was against you. Just like he whispered in the ear of Adam and Eve in the garden. He's against you. 
How can you really trust this love of God? Look at this test. Look at this hardship he's put in front of your eyes that you have to stare at this fruit all day long. He's against you. This is wisdom from below when we judge God's love based upon our circumstances in life. That is folly. But here's the sad truth. Every single one of us are foolish. May we not think higher of ourselves than we ought, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans. May we honestly confess that, Lord, we are given to foolishness. And so often we judge your love based upon circumstances. And sadly, Lord, even from these lips have come these blasphemous words, I thought you loved me. This common thought of man. This was the problem of the people in Malachi's day. This was the problem of Job's friends. Job, your life is so bad because clearly you've sinned because God always does good stuff to good people. So bad stuff has happened, and so bad stuff, you must have been a real big sinner, Job. And this is so grievous to God, so angering to God, that he actually tells Job at the end, you better pray for your friends or I'm going to destroy them from the face of the earth. But this is the natural way men think. This is the prosperity gospel that is still large today. This was the problem of the Pharisees. This is why they, one of the reasons why they got so angry at Jesus, because Jesus was talking and saving sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors. The Pharisees' mind was wrapped up in this. They're bad people. God doesn't love bad people. He loves good people, and he does good things to good people. Why is this Jesus doing good things to bad people? He's against God, was the Pharisees' mind. Even the disciples fell in this trap. You remember with the rich man who was sent away, go sell all your possessions and then come and follow me. The rich man leaves and Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. You remember the disciples' response? Who oh, then can be saved? It was ingrained in their mind that if the rich aren't blessed by God, there's no chance for anybody. It was, it was ingrained in the people's mind because it's a natural thought of fallen man to judge God's love upon our circumstances in life. And this is exactly what we find in the book of Malachi. In the midst of hardship, when you find yourself thinking, God doesn't love me, cast your eyes upon Christ crucified for your sins. And as Job said, clasp your hand over your mouth and consider the love of God for you in Christ. Can you look at Christ crucified and utter those blasphemous words, God doesn't love me. God spared not even his own son for you. Do not judge God's love for you based upon circumstances in life. Life under the sun is hard for each and every one of us. We've all got problems. Every one of us has got, you know, hardships in life. It's not unique to you to have a hard life. We're all in it together. But the call of God's word is for all of us to cast our eyes on Christ and remember the love of God for us in his great and glorious salvation. If all we had in life was ease and good times, we would be destroyed. In the wonderful little book I read from last week at the beginning of the service from Flavel, the Puritan, The Mystery of Providence, he makes that point that he says, if all we had was good providence, we would perish in hell forever because we would never know our need of Christ. If there's no longing, no angst, if there's no desire for something better, no sorrow in this life, why would there ever be glory in Christ? Why would there ever even be the thought of a need of someone to deliver us from this bondage? You see, suffering does not, is not God's clear evidence that he is against you. Remember what the writer of Hebrews tells us. Suffering many times for the people of God is evidence that God is, is desiring to have you cling more closely to Christ, to grow in your relationship with him. Even the Son of Man learned obedience through suffering. If all we had in life was good and ease, we would be destroyed. That's why the psalmist prays, Lord, only give me the bread I need for today. Otherwise, if you give me more than I need, I will forget my need of you. God responds, I love you. Remember your election. 
This back and forth then continues in the book of Malachi with God saying, you've dishonored me. How have we dishonored me? You're sinning. How have we been sinning? You're not worshiping me right. What? I thought our worship was right. This back and forth continues until you find yourself in verse 17 of chapter 2, right before our passage today, where God says this, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But again, the people respond, oh yeah, how have we wearied the Lord? That's a bit of an overstatement. And the prophet responds by saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? The people are constantly questioning God. They're constantly saying and and attacking his character as he's not good. He doesn't really care for his people. Look at the evil. They They prosper in life. It's like God doesn't even care about us. He just blesses those who do evil. You know what? In my mind, it's better to do evil because at least you get some kind of joy out of this life. This is the thought of the people of God. I thought you were God of justice. Obviously, I was mistaken. This is what the people begin to say. And God says, you are wearying me with this kind of language. Now, Pastor Pat dealt with this several months ago. God cannot be wearied. This is, in in theological language, this is called an anthropopathism. It's a human emotion given to God to help us understand what's going on. But God obviously wearies not. But it's just, it's given to emphasize the point that, that it's almost as if God is saying, stop already with your questioning of me. I I do not deserve to be questioned by you. You let me ask the questions of you. You are wearying me with your many words. Let your words before God be few, as the book of Ecclesiastes teaches us. God says, you've been saying lies about me. You've been slandering me. See, the things were not going well. Evil was prevailing, and the people were saying, Living for the Lord doesn't profit me at all. What's the point in doing right? God doesn't care. Life is better for those who don't even try. You know, I've tried the Christianity stuff and it didn't work for me. Haven't you heard that before? Because I thought that if I tried these things, my life would get easier. It didn't. I don't believe. This is not something new to this age. This is what the natural man has always thought. What is, and and now we come to the passage for today, and it's it's an amazing and beautiful passage. And what is God's response to such a rebellious lot? What What is God's response to such vehement accusations that are being leveled against him? What is God's response to such rebellion from those people that claim to be his? What is his response to such irreverent speech? What is his response to such blasphemous accusations? Is God going to thunder down another flood to consume them? And we find amazingly these words uttered by God in response to these last accusations that God is not just at all. God responds to that accusation by saying this, wait, because I'm going to send a Savior to you. (laughs) Wait, the messenger of the covenant is coming, and he's coming quickly. God responds by again declaring his faithfulness, his covenant keeping that I am going to do everything I promised to your forefathers. The messenger of the covenant is coming. The one you've been waiting for is coming. Hold on. Continue on in this pilgrimage. The one is coming. Hope is around the corner. This God who is so grievously being sinned against throughout in the book of Malachi This God who is being so slanderously spoken of by those who claim to be His. This omnipotent, omniscient, all-wise, all-glorious God tells His people His plan to save. He tells His people about His Son who is coming. And you find this throughout Scripture. The Father delights to tell people about His Son. He's always pointing his people, Jehovah God's always pointing his people back to his son. The father delights to point people to his son. 
And we find when the Son comes in the Incarnation, He delights to point people to the Father. And here we find God the Father pointing the people of God away from their problems and their circumstances, taking their head and turning it back to the faithfulness of the covenant promises, saying, I will do this for you, and it's coming quickly. He lovingly redirects their minds back to this foundational covenant of grace. Now, if you've been here a while, you'll understand that phrase, the covenant of grace, but that's a reformed um, understanding of Scripture. And all the covenants of God, you know, there are, there are several covenants. The, the covenant God made with Adam, with, with Abraham, with David. All these covenants are simply part of the covenant of grace. They all fit into this one overarching covenant of grace where God has promised, covenanted with His people to save them, not by their works, but by His work, specifically His work in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so there's the promise again of this covenant of grace. You remember God is saying that when I promised to Adam in the garden, that Adam and Eve, that one would come who would be born of the woman who would crush the serpent's head? You remember that promise? He's coming. You remember that promise I gave to Abraham that through his seed all nations on earth will be blessed? Remember that promise? He's coming. Remember that promise I made to David that one from his line would sit on the throne forever and will always do righteously and act justly and people will find peace and prosperity in him? He's coming. He's coming. The messenger of the covenant is coming. Hold on. Do not throw in the towel because life is hard. That's life under the sun. But one is coming. How amazing is this? The faithfulness of God is jumping off the pages of Scripture. We take our accusations that God is not faithful in Scripture. God replies in His Holy Word, I am faithful. Look at my Son. Do you want to look at Christ and make the accusation that I am not faithful? Everything I've ever promised has come to fruition in Him. As Owen says, He, Christ, is the treasury of all God's grace. All God's promises are hidden in Christ. That's why Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 1.20, all God's promises find their yes or their amen in Christ. There's no blessings, salvific blessings from God that come to His people outside of Christ. He is the messenger of the covenant. But first, before He comes, there will be a forerunner. Someone will come first. And this is what he says in 3.1, Behold, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Even that word, me. What a declaration of the divinity, the deity of Christ. That the, this messenger of the covenant and God are, are spoken of in, in a oneness language. That the Father and the Son, both God. There will be a forerunner. A messenger will come preparing the way. This was a common practice in that day, by the way, when a king or, or someone uh, of import would come into a city, it would not be a, a surprise. It would not be a, oh my word, I did not know the king was coming today. There would have been preparation made in advance. There would have been a messenger coming first to prepare the people, to prepare the city. The king is coming. Get yourselves ready. There was no such thing as a surprise visit from the king. There was to be preparation made. It's the same thing with today. If the, if the president was going to come or, or some leader of the state was to come uh, and visit you, there would be security forces first making sure everything's safe. There, you would know it's happening. There was a messenger declaring, making the way ready. And clearly in the New Testament, we find that this messenger who prepares the way is John the Baptist. John the Baptist declares it of himself. I'm just the one that was said, go make straight the path, prepare the way for the Lord. He says that in Matthew chapter 3. Christ himself says it about John the Baptist and also in the Gospel of Matthew. This one who comes first, this messenger who prepares the way is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist preached a message of repentance. You find that throughout the, the, the Gospels, it declares that John the Baptist was preaching repentance. He was reminding people of their lawlessness and their desperate need of the One who is to come. He was preparing the way for the coming of Christ. You see, preaching repentance 
It is not mean or unloving, but it is necessary to prepare the way for Christ. People must be reminded and told, you are a sinner who has violated God's holy and just law, and you desperately need one to stand in your place. It, this preaching of repentance that John the Baptist was declaring and that he was calling people to forsake their sin, to realize their sinfulness, this was absolutely necessary to prepare the way for Christ. The preaching of repentance is always necessary to prepare the way for Christ. You see, Christ will not seem very sweet to you if your sins do not appear to you as very bitter. Christ's sweetness corresponds to the bitterness of sin. If you think little of your sin, if your sin does not bother you, if it doesn't at times break you down, how could I do this against the Lord? I guarantee you this. Christ will not be a savory aroma in your nostrils. Christ will not be very sweet on your lips and on your tongue. His word you will find no delight in. Because his word is the testimony of the manna from heaven that's sweet like honey, light like wafers baked in honey. Christ is the manna of life. And unless your sin seems very bitter to you, the sweetness of Christ will not seem very wonderful. That's why in Exodus chapter 12, where it's talking about the preparation of the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb was to be roasted with what? Bitter herbs. God's not caring about the flavor of the lamb. Cooking, you know, ideas weren't on God's mind. I really want this to be really fantastically flavored for the people, so cook it with bitter herbs. This is showing that you consume the lamb with bitterness. There's a, there's a sadness. There's, there must be a bitterness to go along with the sacrifice. Cook the lamb with bitter herbs. Unless your sin appears to you as bitter, Christ will not appear to you as very sweet. The preparatory message of repentance is absolutely vital. Has the hard soil of your heart been broken up by the message of repentance so that the seed of the gospel can grow? Because naturally your heart is as hard as stone. That's why Martin Luther, when he nailed his 95 theses on the castle door on October 31st, 1517, the very first one of those theses was all of the Christian life is to be defined by repentance. Repentance isn't just a, a one-time act. It's a way of life for the Christian where we constantly confess our sin, turn, seek, you know, sorrow for our sin, turn from our sins, seek to walk in a way pleasing to God, thankful for what he's done for us in Christ. All of the Christian life is to be, is to be summed up in repentance. Is the Word of God sweet to you? Is the Gospel sweet to you? It sweets you only if you understand your desperate need for mercy. If you do not understand your desperate need for mercy, the Word of God will not seem very attractive to you. For those people who say, I, I just find it really hard to read the Bible. I find it hard to listen to a sermon. You know, I can watch TV. I, I can do this. I can read other books. But when it comes to reading the Bible, that's, it's a little over my head, a little dry. It's too hard. But I can't we make all these excuses. Why? I can't. Why is it so hard for you? Because Christ is not very sweet to you. If Christ is sweet to you, what is better than to feast upon his word? Why was, why was David so in love with the Word of God? Because David was in love with Christ. That's why he could write Psalm 19. And your Word is my delight. Why? Because his delight was Christ. And Christ is held forth in the Word of God. That's why Luther said that the Scriptures are the manger in which you find the Christ child laid. Christ will be sweet only as your sin becomes bitter. That's why Bernard of Clairvaux writing a thousand years ago in the 13th century, 12th century, excuse me, said this, those who never experience desolation can never know the sweetness of consolation. The reason people do not chase after mercy is because they do not understand their misery. The preaching of repentance, when that's lost, the sweetness, the savor of Christ goes with it. John the Baptist was preaching the message of repentance. This is necessary. 
Have you heard the message of repentance? That in and of yourself, you stand as lawless, condemned before God. That your only hope is to turn from your sins and trust in one who has taken the penalty of your sin for you, as Pastor Jason read this morning, one who became a curse for you. Has your hard heart been tilled up by the message of repentance? The Lord is coming, but there will be a forerunner first. And then we also see the Lord is coming, and He will come suddenly, quickly, when the people were not expecting it. And the Lord whom you seek, Malachi says, will come suddenly, when the people are not expecting it, while they are not ready. And don't you find that in the New Testament? Who is ready for the birth of Christ? No one. God even told them, He's coming, and you'll find yourselves not ready. And they didn't hearken to the voice of the Lord. No one was ready. Many were not ready when the Lord appeared. Though God says, you claim to delight in him, the one whom you delight in will suddenly appear, because this word suddenly in the Hebrew brings with it the idea of sudden calamity or sudden, sudden angst or sudden awe. They weren't ready for it. Though they claim to delight in him, God says, the reality of their hearts was that their delight in Christ was merely words because when he came, they were not ready for him and he was not the one that they expected. Again, they had even expectations about what the Messiah should look like and he doesn't meet any of the expectations. Clearly, he can't be from God because we know how God works. And they found themselves unready. It's one thing to say you actually delight in Christ. It's another thing to actually believe it and be ready for him. Not only would many not be ready, but again, he would, they, would be unexpect, they would not be expecting it. It would happen in an unexpected way. People had expectations. God didn't work according to their expectations. God doesn't work according to our expectations. Let his word guide and govern our thoughts. God tells the people that the Christ is coming and that he's coming suddenly in an unexpected way. This right here is both a promise and a warning. And just as it was true then, so it is true again today. My friends, you who are hearing this word of the Lord being preached, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? While clearly Malachi is referring to the first coming of Christ, let us not be so naive or forgetful that Christ is coming again. And the scriptures declare to us, God has declared to us that just as people weren't ready for the first coming, people will not be ready when Christ comes again. My friends, are you slumbering? Are you living for sin? Are you living to fulfill your lusts? Is God going to find you asleep? When his son comes in glory? If you claim to delight in Christ, be ready for him. Have him now while he may be found. Because if you wait till he comes again in glory, he may not be found in that day on salva for salvation. It's too late. That's why the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord now while he may be found found while he is near to you. Scripture constantly calls the people of God, do not procrastinate. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, today is a good day for salvation. Do not procrastinate or you too will find yourself unready at the coming of the Lord. Is Christ the one in whom you delight in? And lastly, we'll talk about this point, that the Lord, not only is he coming suddenly, but he comes to purify and refine his people and their offerings. He comes to refine the people and their offerings. He comes to purify, to refine. And those words, to purify and refine, mean he comes to make precious what was formerly corrupted and polluted. That's why refining is necessary. You take something that is, that, is, that is a mix of pollution and garbage and through fire you refine it. You make it pure and precious and valuable. What formerly was a, was a clump of earth now becomes something precious as it's refined by God. He comes to purify, to refine things that were once corrupt and polluted. 
and unacceptable. There is a need, God tells us, there is a need of a sanctifier, a purifier, if we're to have any hope in this life. If we are going to ever truly know communion with God, we must first be made clean, be made holy. In the Old Testament, as, as Hebrews 9 tells us, now almost everything the writer of Hebrews says was purified through blood. Christ came to purify us through his shedding of blood. Remember the sprinkling of the blood in the Old Testament? What's all that about? Things are being purified by blood. God is showing us that unless blood be shed and be sprinkled on you, there can be no purification. It's not pure. It's not worthy to be, to be, uh, to be in the presence of God. Nothing can be offered on that altar unless blood is sprinkled on it. This is not acceptable to God unless blood is sprinkled on it. The blood needed to be sprinkled for something to be purified, fit to be in the presence of God. And the of Hebrews is telling us that's why Christ shed his blood so that you who are unfit in and of yourselves can be sprinkled, washed in the blood of Christ, and be made pure. And see, this is the beauty of the ordinance of baptism, the sacrament of baptism. It's a picture of how we're washed in Christ, purified of our filth and defilement in Christ. It's only through faith that we're united to Christ. And only through faith being united to Christ are we justified, made pure, made clean. Once the purifying work is done, God again will delight in his people. As he says in verse 4, I'll again delight in you. But purifying must happen first. Now this purifying, very quickly as we close, can be seen both in our justification in Christ, and justification is the, the theological idea that through faith in Christ, His righteousness is imputed to us. Our sin was imputed to Him. This is the, this is the great exchange that our, His righteousness is imputed to us. So when God looks at us, He sees not our sin because our sin was taken away from us and imputed to us. We are justified. God legally, forensically declares, I see one who is righteous and just. This is, purif this is to be purified. This is also definitive sanctification. In God's eyes, we are seen as perfectly holy. We are definitely sanctified. But there's also a truth in Scripture that while we are declared just, while we are justified, where we are made cle clean and purified legally, there's also the process of daily, practically being sanctified, being made holy. And this is commonly referred to as, as progressive sanctification, progressive growing in holiness, progressive growing in purity. While there's initial and legal purifying of justification, we as God's people also need to be being purified each day as we put off sin and seek to grow in righteousness. If we say we delight in Christ, who is the great purifier of men, should we not also delight in purity? As the Lord Jesus himself says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, the works of the flesh, as we grow in our understanding of the loveliness of God and the beauty of Christ, not only, this makes us grow in our love for God. And as we grow in our love for God, what also increases is our hatred for sin. You cannot, you cannot increase in love for sin and love for God at the same time. While one increases, the other decreases. That's why Thomas Chalmers, in his, in his famous sermon from a few hundred years ago, talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. You want to get rid of sin in your life? Love God more. Soak in His Word more. See the beauty of Christ more. And as you increase in your love for God, your, your hatred of sin will be driven away because you cannot serve two masters. You always love one and hate the other. The works of the flesh as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, as Peter prays, the works of the flesh should be replaced by the works of God. The evidence that Christ has purified us judicially is that we'll be being purified practically. The difference for us today is that the messenger of the covenant has come, but his work remains the same to purify a people for his own possession. Are you being purified? For the grace of God has appeared, Titus, and Paul tells Titus, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and holy lives. And then verse 14 tells us that he has redeemed us to purify us as a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Have you been purified by Christ? Are you being purified by Christ? 
Stand with me as I close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this declaration to a rebellious people that the promise of old still stands. That you have not cast off your people because of our lawlessness, but your promise to redeem, to purify, to save holds true. Not because we deserve it, Lord. It holds true because you are God. As you're going to declare, you, the Lord, do not change. That is why we're saved. So we thank you for your unchanging faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for sending the messenger of the covenant, your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we this day increase in our knowledge of you and in our faith in Christ. And may your grace be at work in us, purifying us, so that you delight in both us and the works of our hands. So may we walk by faith even this day, not putting confidence in the works of the flesh, but putting confidence in Christ Jesus, crucified and risen again, the surety of our salvation. Pray these things in his blessed and holy name. Amen. You may be dismissed.